Yeah, come on, that's lobby. <laughs> lobby for your lobby gobblers. Here. <laughs> So welcome to the 19th century and the dawn of the industrial age or to be more precise the dawn of the factory age because we could argue that the industrial revolution started with the Bolton and Watt steam engine or just before that couldn't we and that's true but round about this, t this time period as the 19th century came a whole new system was growing up the factory system where people who had worked in domestic the domestic textile industry usually woolens, for centuries. It's one of the oldest, one of the oldest trades there is, is weaving, isn't it? Because people have always wanted clothes, they've always wanted something to keep warm with. But that had been done as a cottage industry, and the people that worked there had a, a big measure of freedom. Not riches, and at times it got great poverty, but they did have a measure of freedom. But that was all about to change. John Kay's invention of the fly shuttle had transformed the domestic weaving industry and they had to come up with machines that would produce enough yarn to spin enough yarn to keep up with the new fly shuttle. And it led to the invention of Arkwright's water frame and other things that we're going to discuss. But it led to the beginning of the factory system where it moved, as I said, from the cottages into big factories. And the social upheaval was enormous. I, I think we sometimes overlook the changes that was made from the domestic system to the factory system, but we're going to explore it a little bit more. But first, we're going to talk about this new set of uh, this new class that took over the industrialist, the manufacturing class, new money. Now, with these people, there was a full range of ideas. And as far as we know, mostly, those ideas caused a lot of so social deprivation. The people came to the factories and yet they had a job, but they didn't have the best lifestyle, did they? But now and again, history throws up some fantastic people who have some radical ideas. And one of them was Robert Owen. And Robert Owen is best known for his exploits up at New Lanark, but we're going to explore him more and also go into a bit more history. Who was he? How did New Lanark start and what became of his ideas? So, welcome to Scotland and welcome to New Lanark. today a world heritage site and it's beautifully restored and it's still a living breathing community all the houses have been restored and done up and people live here but you're not going to see any sky dishes i'll tell you that now there's also a fantastic hotel and visitors center and you can take a walk up towards the, the falls on the river clyde and that is why the mill is here in the first place the water power on the river clyde now behind the mill originally with three people, one of which was Richard Arkwright. Yeah, our own Richard Arkwright, the inventor of the water frame, who is sometimes known as the father of the factory system. Now, this site is based on his Cromford Mills, and he wasn't a partner long, but nevertheless, he played a massive part in it. So that is why New Lanark Mill is here on the River Clyde. Now, we first visited the site September, October last year. We came up with Derrick Arthur and our Sam. So some of the footage you're going to see is actually from that time period. So if you wonder why <laughs> I keep changing clothes halfway around, that's the reason why. So we're going to have a look now and have a really good look into the history of Robert Owen. So I hope you enjoy this.
of that water is immense and that's what brought Richard Arkwright, a guy named Dempster and David Dale to New Lanark to start these mills and the mills started in 1786 and as I said they were based on Arkwright's mills down in Cromford. But who was David Dale? Well David Dale came from quite humble beginnings and he started his life as a, a cowherd believe it or not but he worked his way up to be a, a merchant banker. In fact Tom Devine described Dale as the greatest of all Scotland's cotton magnets. Like I said he had a, a humble beginning but he moved to Glasgow in 1763 to work for a silk merchant and there he began his own business on the high street also as a merchant. In fact he imported linen from all over Europe and then he made a very astute marriage. He married the chief executive of the Bank of Scotland's daughter. Mm. And that's where he really kind of took off. Then with another guy, he became the first agent in Glasgow of the Royal Bank of Scotland. And then he really went into the cotton industry, into the textile industry greatly. So the mayor at that time of that particular place was um, the guy called Dempster. And then there was Richard Arkwright and Dale himself and they came here and established the mills and they sent local people down to work in um, Arkwright's mills at Cromford to get experience and then come here and this mill really set off but at this point Arkwright dropped out and so did the other guy so there was just really David Dale left now one of David Dale's daughters married a guy by the name of you've got it Robert Owen and Robert Owen then came to New Lanark. Well, let's just have a look into the history of Robert Owen a little bit first, shall we? We've set the foundations of New Lanark, how it came about. And David Dale's not mentioned a lot. Everything's sort of centered on Robert Owen. But um, David Dale had set the precedent in a way because there were certain things that he did. Now, obviously, one of the biggest controversial aspects of the factory system was its use of children. Now, David Dale, he brought kids in from Glasgow a lot of them were just street kids and he brought them here to work in the mill he gave them gave them an education actually as well um, this is actually this school room behind me is uh, attributed to Robert Owen but David Dale also imposed some education upon the children he gave them a job and he gave them at least two sets of dry clothes and somewhere to sleep dry decent quarters with food but they work for nothing they work basically for the board and lodging now He's looked at that as sort of a um, philanthropist, if you will. Well, if you do a mathematical equation, you've got a decimal point in the middle, haven't you? Or somewhere along that equation. And you move it to the right or to the left, and you change that uh, number by a power of 10. Stick with me on this. Now, we call David a philanthropist and other people that looked after children in those days. But how far do you move the decimal point backwards or forwards on a certain subject before being a philanthropist, how close does it get to slavery? I know that sounds a bit extreme, but bear with me, and this is a big thing that we're going to talk about through the different, um, the different videos we're going to do on the cotton industry, the coal mining industry this year as we look into people. So he took children from, from Glasgow, from the city streets, that would have had a terrible life, there's no doubt about that, and he gave them a chance of a bit of a future, well, of a future, a trade, but they still worked for nothing. They were still bound to live and to work in this in this place weren't they so it's an interesting subject that needs a bit more exploration isn't it Now, Robert was born in Newton or Newtown in Montgomeryshire in Wales and he was the sixth of seven children. His dad was a saddle and ironmonger and also a postmaster. He didn't have a great deal of an education, what, and what education he had, 
He kind of left school when he was 10 and he was apprenticed for a start to a draper in Lincolnshire. And that's where he would have started to learn all about textiles, all about threads, all about weaving and so forth. Now, he left there to move to Manchester when he was 18. And again, he started working for the drapers in Manchester. But Manchester was where the cotton explosion was happening. Manchester always was the centre of things in the cotton textile industry. It's where the cotton exchange was. Cotton, Manchester was to cotton what Newcastle, the coal exchange, is to Newcastle, if you know what I mean, to the coal industry. So that is where some of the, uh, the dramatic events were happening. And it was there that he got involved with manufacturing cotton machinery and the people that were doing it. Uh, and it was there that he got, also got involved with a mill that had the first steam engine there in Manchester. Talk about that a bit more. Now when Robert first arrived in Manchester, he was quite a shy sort of a lad. He, he would stammer when he tried to hold a conversation. He had a little confidence and he certainly blushed when he was in the uh, company of young ladies. Well, that soon altered and he became a fine orator. In fact, he held court in front of halls where he was trying to teach his, uh, his philosophy to people who wanted nothing to do with his philosophy. And it was also said of Robert that he had a fine eye for muslin. He knew what he was looking for. He knew his trade. And that obviously came from his draper's upbringing. So muslins, he had an eye for that. And muslin is a very fine cloth that can be used to create fancy goods. And that's where he was specializing. But then he met up with a guy that was into making machinery. Now, as I said, there was many inventions coming along at the time, certainly in the cotton spinning. And a lot of them were going to be powered by this gigantic force behind me, water. Now, Robert met a guy by the name of John Jones. And John, now he was interested in these machines, particularly a new invention by Samuel Crompton, the mule. Now, sadly, Samuel, even though he'd made this invention, he couldn't afford to patent it. But guess who bought the patent? David Gale, that's right. Now, John said to uh, Robert, when they were in company that he'd, he'd seen some of these fantastic machines and the opportunities that were there for people that could manufacture them and he wanted to get into it and make a business of it and he invited Robert to join him which Robert did and the machine they particularly went into manufacturing was Crompton's Mule or for a start certainly a small version of it now John persuaded Robert to ask his brother William for a hundred pounds so they could set up in business and this he did so they set up not only just selling and manufacturing and making these mules, but also they acted as putter outers. Now a putter outer basically meant that you gave the robins or the, the unspun yarn out to local spinners. They would then spin it at home and then give it back to you and you would pay them for the finished yarn. Uh, so that's what a putter outer was. There were putter outers all over the domestic industry. That's what drove the domestic industry. But anyway, let's get back to Robert and John. Sadly, Robert soon discovered that John hadn't really got a, an aptitude for business, but he met somebody else who did, and his name was Drinkwater. water power still being used on the Clyde today. Fantastic, isn't it? So anyway, Robert left the warehouse on New Bridge Street, there where he'd been partnered with John Jones, and he teamed up with Peter Drinkwater. Now, Peter built Banktop Mill in, in Piccadilly, Manchester, which is now, I think it's still the New City Hotel. You would never think that there was a, such a mill there. And that mill became the first steam-powered mill in Manchester. There's lots of uh, documentation, which again you could make a whole new video about, of um, Drinkwater's involvement with Bolton and Watt. And he ended up installing an 8 horsepower steam engine. Can you imagine? 8 horsepower. Now, Robert became manager of that mill. Now, and one historian states that Robert was the first person to import raw cotton from uh, the American. Hang on, which island was it? To quote it correct, he imported the first ever bags of American Sea Island and that was in 1791. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's what one historian claims. He, um, now, he, while he was running Banktop Mill, 
he visited New Lanark on many occasions, I believe, and he also made the acquaintance of David Dale's daughter. And he fell in love, as you do, and he eventually moved up to New Lanark and became partners with David Dale. And then he, later, he became, I won't say a sole partner because he took on investors as well, but Robert Owen became the runner, if you will, of New Lanark Mills. And he carried on from where David had left off. Like I said, David, he had employed kids from the, the streets of Glasgow, give them a good start in life, but Robert took it even further. Robert had other ideas on how people should live. And as you've seen walking up this woodlands, it's a beautiful place. And one thing that was said about um, New Lanark in 1819, now you've seen some of the beautiful countryside walking up the river and everything. Well, it said that the people who worked here could enjoy a modest, a, a modicum of health and happiness. And they were considered good at that. Modest health and happiness, were they not worth more? Well, Robert Owen decided they were, they were worth more. But sadly, that put him at loggerheads with other industrialists, you, you Joe Gradgrinds of this world, that really wanted maximum profits. So he became a man that was not hated, but he certainly wasn't encouraged very much. He was in certain circles, but let's go into more of what Robert Owen actually did. Now Owen and his partners took over the mill in 1799 and they bought it off David Dale, they bought David Dale out at that particular point and uh, Robert became the manager in the year 1800. Now while he'd been in Manchester, he'd been a member of the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society, that's hard for me to say. So undoubt undoubtedly he was, he was like a utopian socialist really and he tried to implement these ideas at this mill. If you will, he tried to implement the new millennium there and then. Those were the ideas he was trying to plant. And it certainly wasn't something that would uh, resonate amongst other industrialists and manufacturers. But he had a certain success with it. And people flocked from all over to see exactly what he was doing here at New Lanark, Including the future Tsar of Russia, Tsar Nicholas. But sadly, his other investors and his other partners didn't always see things the same way that Robert did. And by 1813, they were getting a little bit fed up that, well, perhaps they could have more of the share of the profits, you know, the Joe Grag grinds were creeping in. So he sold his share, and the, the amount he got for it was the equivalent of 800,000 American US dollars. But that freed him up to do other things. But his notable achievements, obviously, was how he pioneered childcare and uh, child education. He really went to town on that, and it wasn't a stern education. The education was important because now with the new uh, industrial age, well, you needed clerks, you needed engineers, you needed mechanics, you needed people to be able to read and write. And that's a fantastic thing about education. It opens up an all new world to people, but it can be used in another way because people can be indoctrinated to think in a certain way. But it looks like Owen kept away from these things. And another thing he pioneered, and this is really interesting, he actually initiated the first eight hour day. Now, the eight hour act hadn't even come in in the mining industry in the first decade of the 1900s. Yet, it was Owen that pioneered it. In 1825, Robert purchased land at a place he called Harmony in Indiana, in the USA, where he wanted to make a utopian society, and he was joined by other people in that. But sadly, by 1828, he returned to Britain, because uh, it was really a, it was a failure. The thing is, when you get other people involved, it doesn't always work out the way you want it to, does it?
Dunn's or who said it's a small world, eh? This is the upper dance room. Robert Owen also insisted that they dance, so they came, they were up here for a quarter to eight in the morning dancing before the school started. You can tell they weren't Methodists. This is a representation of the mill workers' house. You've got it in two decades. The first bit down here is the 1930s, if you listen to the radio. Oops, sorry kid. And then we go back to the 1820s and this is what it would have been like for the first set of people really that worked here. But we compare this to some of the housing around Manchester when you go, especially when you go through Engels and what life was like there in Manchester. Um, total difference. So yeah, perhaps not paradise, but like I said, you compare it to uh, Engels and Manchester if you look there, there's a truckle bed. Right? It's called a truckle bed because it's, uh, it literally wheels our trucks back under during the day into the main bed. So this is the living space that people would have had downstairs. You can see the bed there again, better. Our trucks back underneath, goes underneath. So how many, fam how many people in the family would be sleeping in this one room? And there'd be a family above and a family above them as well. The only good thing is it's handy for work. I know what would run that. Steam, boilers, just water. I steam power, you have boilers, yeah, yeah. the mill engineer which has special interest because it's a petri made in Rochdale and a lot of the old mills in Rosendale like um, Boar's Greve Mill, all up cow, they all had petri engines constructed from Rochdale so a little bit of home up here in Scotland. Fantastic engineering.
we really want to do with this Robert Owen story is show and really bring to life the change from the, the domestic system with the handloom here to the mill system. Because our time sort of bookends it, we've gone away from the, the industrial system. Uh, and there was a big fight. What Robert Owen tried to do here was bring a utopia, whereas in the rest of the country there was a big battle. Taking people from the freedom, relative freedom, of domestic work. If you're self-employed, you'll understand. But I'll give you an idea. You could worship St Monday, as in, you didn't need to go to work on Monday. You just made up during the week. Some friends might call, you got a headache, you lay in bed an extra hour, and you go for a walk in the garden with your friends. It was a total different thing. And also, work hard all your life, you might accumulate a couple of couple of loons. And as one guy said, when I die, missus, to his wife, at least you've got these loons. Now, if he worked in a mill, what did he got to leave for his wife, apart from the debt of actually burying him? So there's a big thing, a big change in society from the old domestic system into the factory system. And that generation fought it. So we're in his house now, that's a portrait of the great man himself. Uh, his house isn't that fancy, it's a bit like walking around a, a parsonage at, at, at Haworth. I hope you've enjoyed our little view round New Lanark and a little taste of Robert Owen. But I'd like to finish on this point. This is actually his house. And if we look behind me, those like tenements with the mill workers' houses. And what really hit me when I was looking through the window out of his front room, how close he was to where the mill workers were. That's where he and his family lived. That much, that's how much he believed in what he was trying to do that he was immersed amongst the people that he worked with and he brought his children up amongst the work people. Now we get today's entrepreneurs and um, philanthropists, if you believe that they are philanthropists, they lived in gated communities. Even to an extent, the Whiteheads in Rottenstall built their home just outside, didn't they, just on the Holly Mount. But Robert Owen lived amongst his people. And I think that's one of the biggest things I'm gonna take away from here today. Now, unlike many of the men that invented the machinery that was used in these mills. Robert didn't die in poverty like many of those did. In fact, his two well, two, some of his sons, they provided him quite an adequate pension so he could live out the rest of his life preaching what he believed in. That was his utopian society. He got involved in many things with social reform. He did good things. Uh, he wrote his own memoirs, which is something I would recommend you, you reading. And he sadly died back in his back in 1858 and was buried back in his hometown there in uh, Montgomeryshire. Now we've only just scratched the surface on Robert Owen. There's mo we could have another two or three videos on him, but I hope it's whetted your appetite and you've enjoyed our visit here to this World Heritage Site. So I'll ask you to like, subscribe and share our videos so we can get the word out even more and we can build this channel. And again, thanks for watching. And if you'd like to also follow us on Facebook, our Facebook page is Rosendale Collieries, where we do tend to concentrate more on the, the pits around East Lancashire and also up in Cumbria. And you can also follow us on Twitter now under at Alston Cole. So again, thanks for watching. We hope to see you shortly. Good morning.